Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to crypto in the cloud and proxies in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the sixth of seven videos for Domain 4. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a piddling part of our complete CCSP masterclass. We use cryptography in a frankly astonishing number of ways and places throughout the cloud. Let's start here with this diagram, with this VM. We can use tons of cryptography within the VM. Disk encryption, whole drive encrypting the VM's virtual disk or just encrypting individual files or folders. Secure network communication protocols, such as TLS, SSH, and VPNs use a ton of cryptography. Application level encryption, applications can encrypt data. We can do things like data integrity checks using hashing, DRM or IRM technologies to protect data in use, digital rights management or information rights management. Secure key storage using a virtual TPM, a trusted platform module. The list goes on and on just within the VM. And the VM, of course, is running atop a hypervisor. And the hypervisor can use all sorts of encryption, encrypting virtual machine disk images, secure inter-VM communication, encrypting network traffic between VMs, isolating VM memory, encrypting the memory of each virtual machine, secure VM migration, encrypting data during live migrations, authenticating access to the hypervisor through the use of digital certificates. So a ton of places we can use encryption within the hypervisor. Encryption, of course, is also used on the compute node, the, the physical server for secure boot processes, authenticating, providing secure remote access, uh, the physical TPM, and so on. There's, of course, loads of encryption that can be used on the software-defined network, encrypting the control plane communication, ensuring commands and configuration integrity and preventing unauthorized access or control, data plane encryption to encrypt data in transit across the network using protocols like, say, IPsec, authentication of network devices using digital certificates or pre-shared keys, key management to distribute and manage cryptographic keys securely across devices, and virtual functions across the SDN, and the list goes on and on. We can use lots of cryptography to secure volume and object storage, encrypting data at rest, in transit, and hashing to verify the integrity of data. Lots more encryption can be used across the storage controllers. Whole drive encryption can be used uh, even for the physical hard drives. And let's not forget the management plane. Gobs of cryptography can be used across it. So much. <laughs> so as you can see here, right, we can use cryptography in a fairly ridiculous number of places across the cloud. Should you enable and use cryptography in every possible place? Absolutely not. That would be a terrible idea and would make systems brutally slower, more brittle, difficult to maintain, and user hostile, to name just a few issues. As with any security control, you need to think carefully about what are the risks and how can you best mitigate those risks what is cost justified and what will help the organization achieve its goals and objectives. This will help you decide where you should actually use cryptography in the cloud. So with that overly long intro out of the way, let's now finally dive into more detail of where we can use cryptography in the cloud. For data in use, we can use existing technologies like DRM, digital rights management, and IRM, information rights management. We talked about these technologies in a lot more detail back in the fifth mind map of domain two, link in the description below. Homomorphic encryption allows computations to be performed on ciphertext without requiring access to the plain text data. In other words, operations can be performed on data while it remains encrypted. This is a super cool idea. However, the technology is still relatively early stages and it isn't practical for most applications. It's horrendously slow for most applications. So homomorphic encryption, cool idea, not super practical at the moment. Encryption in motion involves encryption of data as it moves across a network. We use technologies like VPNs, TLS, and IPsec to encrypt data in motion. A VPN, a virtual private network, is an encrypted tunnel where data that is sent through the tunnel is encrypted. Let's now talk about the major VPN protocol that you need to know about for the exam, IPsec. 
IPsec is a standardized suite of protocols that work together to allow a massive degree of flexibility in how IPsec can be configured to create a VPN. IPsec can be run in two different modes, transport mode, which means the original packet header is reused, and transport mode is more efficient and can be used if the tunnel is not required for internal communications within a private network or instance. So that's transport mode, more efficient. Tunnel mode means a new header is created, encapsulating the original packet header and payload. This allows encrypted packets to be routed across the internet. All right, next up, another protocol commonly used for establishing VPNs and many other uses is SSL TLS. Let's start with naming and versions. SSL, Secure Socket Layer, was the name of the protocol for the first three major versions. The protocol was then renamed Transport Layer Security to better reflect that it operates at Layer 4, the transport layer of the OSI model. So SSL TLS are the same protocol, just different versions. And TLS is the name of the most recent versions. TLS was primarily created to authenticate and encrypt the connection between a web browser and a web server. But TLS can be used to secure many other types of connections and will allow you to create even a VPN these days. It's important to understand a couple of protocols within TLS that are required to establish a connection. The handshake protocol is responsible for authentication and key exchange, creating symmetric session keys necessary to establish secure sessions. Once the handshake protocol has established a secure connection, we use the record protocol to securely transmit application data. All right, moving on, we will now talk about encrypting data at rest, which of course means we're encrypting data in storage. Storage level encryption refers to using whole drive encryption on the physical hard drives that data is stored on. This essentially provides automatic and transparent encryption where data is written to storage and decrypted when accessed by an unauthorized user, which has minimal performance impact. And storage level encryption is really important to protect the data on hard drives if a hard drive fails. By using whole drive encryption, that data is encrypted, helping to protect the data until the, the drive can be securely disposed of by shredding it or melting it or something like that. We can encrypt volumes, virtual hard drives. A volume, of course, is a virtual hard drive. So we can essentially whole drive encrypt the entire volume. And it's also possible to encrypt individual files and folders that are stored in the volume, just like a physical hard drive. So there's a number of different ways that we can encrypt data. Encrypt the whole volume or encrypt the data that we store in the volume. In object storage, a customer can encrypt data before sending it to object storage or rely on the cloud service provider to encrypt the data once it's received and stored in object storage or both. When it comes to databases, we can encrypt data in several different ways. First, the application can encrypt data prior to sending it to the database. This is a great way to really protect the data, but this severely limits the use of the database because the database has no idea what data you're sending it. It's just seeing a bunch of ciphertext. So you can't sort, search through, or you know, do a lot of the useful functions that a database would normally provide if you're using application encryption. Another option is to use a proxy that encrypts the data between the application and the database. This is often used when you want application encryption, but you've got an old legacy application that doesn't support the ability to encrypt the data. So you could put a proxy between the application and the database, and the proxy would encrypt the data before sending it to the database. This approach, though, again, severely limits the functionality of the database because the database has no idea what the data is. It's just a bunch of ciphertext. Next, the database itself can perform the encryption and decryption, which means that the functionality of the database is maintained. So this is great. It will, of course, degrade the performance of the database to a degree because it's having to encrypt and decrypt the data. And the final option we'll discuss here is file encryption, which is basically involves encrypting the entire database as a file. Well, imagine you power down and turn off your database. It essentially becomes a big file and there could be sensitive data that you want to protect in that file, essentially. So you could encrypt the entire file. All right, so now let's think about if you want to encrypt anything, there are three major components you need. The data, the encryption engine, you know, the, out, the encryption algorithm, and the key. Let's go through each of these. 
the data is whatever sensitive data that you want to encrypt. Pretty straightforward, <laughs> nothing to discuss here, so moving on. The encryption engine is the algorithm used to encrypt and decrypt the data. This could be something like AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, or RC4, or RSA. So the encryption engine is the algorithm that's encrypting or decrypting the data. Now the most important part, the keys. The keys are a crypto variable that is processed alongside the data in the encryption engine to encrypt the data. Now, if you really want to secure your data, it's not a good idea to keep all your eggs in one basket. Put another way, it's not a good idea to have the data, the encryption engine, and the keys stored on a single system. If that system is compromised, then your sensitive data is going to be exposed. So for much better security, it's a good idea to store something somewhere else. So what's easiest or best to move somewhere else? The data? Probably not. It could be a lot of data and therefore a pain to move. How about the encryption engine? No, because there's no point in moving it. The best algorithms we use are open source. Everyone has access to these algorithms, so there's no point in moving the encryption engine. So that leaves us with the keys. We could potentially store the keys on another system for better security. Let's look at the options here. The first is internally managed keys, which involves storing keys on the VM or the container. While this makes them easily accessible, makes the keys easily accessible, it also makes it easier for an attacker to gain access to the sensitive data on the system. Because if they gain access to the system, they have access to the data, the engine, and the keys. So while this is the easiest, it's the least secure option as all your eggs are in one basket. Externally managed keys are stored away from the VM or container, stored somewhere else. One example is to store the keys in a hardware security module, an HSM at, say, your cloud provider, where the data is stored. Or, even more secure, store the keys in an HSM at a different cloud provider, or even on-premise in your own data center. That's externally managed encryption. And the final type here, escrow. A subtype of externally managed keys are those held in escrow by a managed third party. And this can be good for keeping them away from the instance, but you do have to worry about the availability if the escrow provider goes down. Okay, next. Moving on to the last major topic of this mind map, proxies. Proxies act as intermediaries between clients and servers, providing access control, caching, secure inspection, and many other security-related functions. So let's go through a few different types of proxies. Web application firewalls are a type of proxy that sits between users and web servers. Web application firewalls, WAFs, understand HTTPS traffic, and so they can inspect the requests being sent to the web server and potentially detect and block things like cross-site scripting and cookie poisoning and cross-site request forgery attacks. So a WAF, a web application firewall, is an extra layer of protection in front of a web server. Database activity monitors and DAMs are the same idea. This, this is a proxy that sits in front of a database server. DAMs can inspect both the requests going to the server, the database server, and the responses coming back. And the DAM, the database activity monitor, can block traffic or send alerts if it detects anything suspicious. File activity monitors sit in front of, you guessed it, file servers. <laughs> file activity monitors inspect requests, it can block suspicious requests, which helps to prevent things like data exfiltration. And the final type of proxy we'll talk about here is an API gateway. An API gateway acts as a single point of entry for all client API requests to a organization's, a system's backend services. The API gateway can handle tasks such as request routing, sending requests to the right backend service, authentication, rate limiting, and load balancing making it easier to manage multiple services behind a unified interface. By centralizing these functions, an API gateway can impose security, reduce latency, and simplify client interactions with complex backends, particularly in microservices architectures, because the client just needs to interact with the one API gateway. And there you go. That's an overview of cryptography in the clouds from Domain 4, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam. Thank you.